Holy Father, we thank you so much for the wonderful opportunity that you give us to come to your temple tonight, uh, today. <laughs> thank you because it's another beautiful Sabbath morning. We get to praise your name. And Father, I want to ask that uh, as your word is presented, you may open our hearts and minds to receive it and to be blessed by the messages today. This we pray in your precious name, Father. Amen. Happy Sabbath, guys. <laughs> All right. The senior class of 2020 has taken the aim and model from the section of the book called Testimonies of the Church, Volume 5. More specifically, Chapter 12, which is titled Agents of Satan. I want to read the very first paragraph and just a few more, uh, just to get the context of what we're choosing for our class motto and aim, and the reason why we did it for our class. So the first paragraph says, Satan uses men and women as agents to solicit to sin and make it attractive. These agents he faithfully educates to so disguise sin that he can more successfully destroy souls and rob Christ of his glory. Satan is the great enemy of God and man. He transforms himself through his agents into agents, angels of light. In the scriptures, he is called a destroyer, an accuser of the brethren, a deceiver, a liar, a tormentor, and a murderer. Satan has many in his employ, but it is most successful when he can use professed Christians for his satanic work. And the greater their influence, the more elevated their position, the more knowledge they profess of God and his service, the more successfully can he use them. Whoever entices to sin is his agent. So in essence, the human race can become agents of Satan, not just the demons. As Christ's ambassadors, I entreat you who profess present truth to promptly resent any re approach to impurity and forsake the society of those who breathe in unpure suggestion. Loathe these defiling sins with the most intense hatred. Flee from those who would, even in conversation, let the mind run in such a channel, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. So for those people that are struggling in sin, we are not to dwell in their sins, but we're not supposed to hate the sinner. We hate the sin, but not the sinner. So we have to remember that we must love the sinner. As those who practice these defiling sins are steadily increasing in the world and would intrude themselves into our churches, I warn you to give no place to them. Turn from the seducer. Though a professed follower of Christ, he is Satan in a form of man. He has borrowed the livery of heaven that he may better serve his master. You should not for one moment give place to an impure, covert suggestion, for even this will stain the soul, as impure water defiles the channel through which it passes. And also on to the paragraph that we chose for this class. Choose poverty, reproach, separation from friends, or any suffering rather than to defile the soul with sin. Death before dishonor or the transgression of God's law should be the motto of every Christian. As a people professing to be reformers, treasuring the most solemn, purifying truths of God's word, we must elevate the standard far higher than it is at this present time. That God's people must be cleansed from all sins before he comes. Family, I want to ask you a question. Do you believe that it is possible to have victory over sin? Once you have gained the victory over life, the sin in your life, then go help others find the victory over sin in their lives. We cannot stop and criticize our brothers and sisters that are struggling in sin. Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Sin is the transgression of God's law, and that means that it is going against the very character of God. Today and forevermore, what will you decide to do with the rest of your life? Though short as it is, will you uphold the banner of Christ or the banner of the enemy? You only have those two choices, and nothing in this world can separate you from the love of God except your choice. Choose wisely today. Let your model be that you rather die than to dishonor the entire kingdom of heaven and his law. We must press forward and raise the standard higher, much higher than it is at this present time. To live is Christ, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. If I had to describe personally my year and 
what, it, what was the theme of it, there were two things. One of them was patience, and the other one was trusting in God, which they're both kind of really closely related. Um, because whenever you don't know what's coming up ahead, whenever you're in the middle of a storm, whenever things are going really, really badly, you need to be able to trust in God and be patient to let Him work things out. And one of the best ways to do that is to look over your life and to see what He has done, where He has led you from. But when I went through that journey of looking back, it seemed like things kind of happened randomly, right? Uh, I wasn't planned, I just happened to be born, you know? Um, you know, and I happened to be born in a wonderful family, but it was still not planned. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the Lord, I, I remember all of these times when I was a kid and I used to have problems and I used to cry to God and I'd be like, can you please just, you know, give me some friends. I, I would love to have, find people that want to serve you just like I do, that I'm not the only weird one out there. Uh, and I felt really alone at those times. And uh, a couple years back when, when I went through something that was kind of really, really hard on me, it felt like I was all by myself. And so I remember crying out to God and being like, where are you? You know, I thought you were in control. I thought you cared about me. So why is this happening? But now that I look back, the Lord's has been guiding all along. He chose the place where I was going to be born, he chose the family to which to send me. He saw each time I cried. And although he didn't answer the prayer right there and then, he has answered it now. He's given me amazing friends. He's given me a beautiful second family here at Washita. Um, he's been working things out. And so when the end of this year came around, all of us seniors are scrambling to figure out what we're gonna do with our lives, where we're gonna go, what are we gonna do, how are we gonna pay for it. Um, and I was having this moment of like freaking out. And then the Lord's like, I've been guiding you all along. I've held your life till now. I know where I'm going to take you in the end. I see your future. Please trust me. And so in in thought of that, um, the Lord kind of helped me out penning this song. And it's just a journey that I think we all have at one point or another. And I hope it's a blessing to you guys. Just trust me on. 
Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. So I'm going to share with you a little about our mission trip, uh, senior mission trip, just for me, Alex, and Kevin. Uh, we had a different program than the others for some personal reasons. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to talk about home evangelism, which is our main theory of our mission trip, um, other than canvassing. Uh, so we are with David Machado. I don't know, I don't know how many of you know him. Uh, he is a foreign graduate from OHC. And yeah, he was just amazing. And what his theory about um, evangelism is all teaching us about how we're going to do Bible study to the beginners of um, the unbelievers and how do we you know, deal with different situations. Um, yeah, and before I went there, I thought I wasn't going to learn anything because I know all of this. I was born as a, you know, Adventist. So, I mean, we know all of those, right? But what surprised me was God is so amazing to all of us because there's so much we can learn and so much we don't know just about him. So, yeah, um, I learned a lot. And God was mm, blessing to me. Um, we meet a lot of people, different people around the area. And then there was this lady I met, I met. She was like, I don't know if it's supposed, do I supposed to go on Sunday to church or do I supposed to go on Saturday, you know? So I told him like, well, you see, the Bible says this, this, and that, but people says this, this, and that. So like, who do you trust? Is, is it the people or is it God? So she was like, well, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so she, she was like, well, of course I would trust God. So. I said, well, where God lead you is where you're going to go. Right? So I think she was one of the baptism of the program. And I was very excited about that. And she told me, yeah, God changed her whole life through the evangelistic theory. Um, we, showed him, we showed her how the Bible is really about. And she learned a lot about the truth. And yeah. That's our program. And you don't know how much this world needs um, missionaries and evangelistics. Um, yeah, I'm going to share just in general. And Alex, I'll leave some for Alex and yeah, Kevin. God bless you. Happy Sabbath. Um, I got the privilege to go on a mission trip here locally, <laughs> being with Kevin and Caleb. Uh, we got the privilege of going to Hot Springs Church and doing evangelistic, we'll help out an evangelistic series with David Machado. As, um, this mission trip not only taught me to search, um, win souls outside of church, but also inside church. It's not only just going out and, you know, trying to bring people inside the church, but making sure that the people inside the church stay in the church. So this evangelistic series um, helped me see that there's, there's, you know, churches that are actually, you know, like losing the heat or the fire for God. And as I was seeing as it, week by week, day by day, seeing um, Hot Springs Church, 
I could just see the flames picking back up. People were starting to come. And in one, uh, in one occasion, um, it was Brother uh, Joshua. He dropped me off in a neighborhood. And uh, I did that neighborhood for like two hours. And in two hours, I got to do a little circle. It was a neighborhood with a circle on It's a street. <laughs> and um, as right as I was ending that, that street, I knocked on this uh, house, and this lady came up and opened the door. And, and she, had, um, she had health issues uh, because she tried to stay away from me. And I was, you know, I tried to be friendly, so I gave her the book in her hand, of course. And I started asking questions, and she just kept looking at me, like didn't take her eyes off uh, of my eyes, which I feel very uncomfortable when that happens. I don't like people staring in my eyes. <laughs> I feel very, um, um, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> but, um, well, as, as I kept talking about the book, uh, and she, she interrupted me. She says, I know you. I've seen you before. And I was like, um, you probably know me from the academy, Washington uh, Hills. It's in Amity. She's like, no, I've seen you in, in Hot Springs. And um, she's like, you go to the Adventist church. And I said, yes, I do. She's like, I go to that church too. And I, I was like, oh, I was not trying to sound uh, like, you know, I've never seen it before. So it's, it's a big church. So I was like, oh, yeah, that's, you know, that, I, that's good. <laughs> And she, she's like, yeah, but I haven't been there in a while. And I was like, oh, okay, that's, that's why I haven't seen you. And um, she's like, yeah, I only went one time for the, for the beginning of the evangelistic series. And this was already one week in, in, into the evangelistic series. So uh, I said, why haven't you gone um, uh, recently? And she said, because uh, I've just been staying at home. I've been kind of sick. And I don't know, I just don't feel very welcome at my church no more. And um, and I said, well, it's like the, the preacher right now, you know him, is David Machado. He, his sermons are, you know, powerful, heart touching. The stories that he ends with, you know, have changed my life and they're changing it to, to this day. They're changing many people's lives in the in the and um, in the church. And um, she just stopped and, and looked down for a little bit. She's like, yeah, it's just it feels like my church ain't the same no more. And um, I this I said. Something that David Machado told me, um, which I have heard many times, but I don't know, it just seemed to stick when he told me. He said, uh, he said the, the church isn't a, a house for uh, saints. It's a hospital for sinners. And as a, I told her that, she looked down and she said, come here, come inside. And all of a sudden, her sickness went away. And I was like, okay. And she sat me down and she's like, I need this book. And I was, I had already started with Habits That Heal because when I see people going through some uh, health issues, I always start with that one. And um, she wanted it. She got the cookbook too. And at the very end of the conversation, I got to see a little bit of relief that she had someone to talk to, someone that actually cared. And I got to see a little bit of spark come uh, that, you know, to try to pursue God again. And uh, if, since, I, since that day, the, the rest of the week, she started going and attending. And every time that at the end of the sermon, she would always come, it's like, hey, you remember me? It's like, you're the girl, that, you're the, uh, I'm the lady that you canvassed. And I'm like, yeah, I remember you. And now I remember you. I don't remember her name, but I remember her name. <laughs> but, <laughs> and it's just heart touching. The, the simple fact that, I got to see that it's not only people that we have to reach outside, but also inside of our church. So whenever we go to a church, you know, be friendly, be warming to them, even if you don't know them, because we're all family in the eyes of God. Happy Sabbath. There we go. Now, um, unfortunately, during this mission trip, I had become struck down with a deadly illness known as the flu. Thankfully, it didn't kill me, but it was on the brink of that, seemed like, if you know what I'm saying. And so that had wiped me out, unfortunately, for a large section of this. But thankfully, I was able to canvas for one day. So I decided, well, you know what? I'm going to make the most of this, right? I'm going to put everything I got into it and see if I can make up some, some time. Now, prior to this, I had um, 
one of my one of my cherished quotes of Ellen Y. I'm not sure where it's found, but one of my cherished quotes went something along the lines of, "Not everyone is meant to be a canvasser, right?" And so I had hung to that quite strongly. Um, but I decided, you know, this is a new experience. It's one day. We're going to give it a shot, right? And so I, I went into it, and they trained me throughout the morning, and I canvassed some in the afternoon. And, you know, I had a blast. It was really fun. I'm not saying that was one day, so I can't really, you know, put, put everything, hang everything on that one day. But I had a blast, and it was fun. And now I'm just, I realize that if God wants you to do something, um, you shouldn't complain because it's not going to be as bad as, our humans, our human tendencies make it out to be. And so the lesson I would draw from that is just have an open mind to, to things that God asks you to do, and you will be blessed. All right, well, happy Sabbath again. Well, today, um, um, the mission offering we're going to be picking up for today is actually going to go through um, to help out with the lingering expenses for our senior mission trip. Um, oh, sorry. For a home and for those who went out of the country. And what we're going to do is just on your way out, um, we're going to have a box right here at the entrance. Not a box. It's a basket. Sorry. Um, but um, uh, on your way out, you could just go ahead and drop it there. We won't be passing um, anything out. But thank you. Happy Sabbath. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everybody. How are you all doing this morning? Wonderful? Well? I hope. I hope you're doing well. So, this last week, hold on, okay, so this last week was actually the first um, week of a new quarter for our lesson, and the topic for this whole new quarter, I guess the second quarter of the year, would be making friends for God, and I like this topic because, well, I like making friends. And those of you that know me know, know that's true. And so, but you got to realize that there is a right way and a wrong way to make friends. <laughs> and, you know, so we can either make friends and we can lead them to Christ or we can make friends and we can lead them away. And it's, and it's our choice. And this is kind of going in, this lesson is kind of talking about missionary, missionary efforts and, and um, you know, the joy of we get from, we, the joy that we get sharing with people and, you know, you know, basically making friends and leading them to God, which is probably one of the most joyful things you can do. So before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. I'm going to kneel and you can join me if you're able. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for this day, Lord, and I just want to ask that you give us understanding and wisdom, and Lord, I just want to thank you so much for all the blessings you've given us, and and I just want to ask for each person here that you may guide and bless and direct in their life and show them that you are ever present. In your name, amen. So, <clears throat> real quick before I get started. Is it, all, is it at all possible for people to, like, get a mic passed around? No? You'll be holding the mics. Is that okay? Okay. So if you have a comment at any time, please comment because, yeah. Anyways, I don't, I don't like preaching. So if you please comment, and they'll come to you, and you can say whatever you want. So, but just to get in... You know, we were all created as social human beings. You know, part of the reason why this grad is so different is because we can't be as social as we normally like to be. You know, we haven't seen each other for a long time. You know, you want to go and give somebody a hug. You know, you want to talk to them. You want to... But no, you can't do that. Why? Well, because there's a pandemic. But anyways, <laughs> you may... Anyway, so we can't do that, and that's taking part of the joy out of grad. You can't have, you know, all the people that we wanted to come because, I mean, we're social. We like, we like people. And so God created us to be social. God created us to have friends. But like I said, there is a right and a wrong way. 
But anyways, let's jump in. Let's all turn to Luke 19, verse 10. Luke 19, verse 10. And would somebody like to read that? Would anybody like to read that? Okay, I'll read it. Okay. It says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and save that which is lost. So, what was Christ's mission on earth? Right. So, basically, yeah, I mean, you guys know the plan, you know, what happened at the fall, the plan of redemption. So Christ, that was his mission on earth. Now, what is our mission? So let's go to Matthew 28, 19 and 20, and that is probably very well known, but we'll go to it anyways and we'll read it. And does, would somebody like to read Matthew 28, 19 and 20? Okay, Dileen. Dileen can... Okay. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Okay, so our mission in life is to go and bring the gospel that Christ came to seek and save the lost, to bring that truth to people, right? So that, that is basically our one goal. When Christ came, he told his disciples, you know, go baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son, teaching them to observe all things. And so that's what our goal is. In making friendship should be to lead others to what Christ's mission was of seeking and saving the lost, of dying for them. And so one thing that I was thinking about kind of as I was studying this lesson is what, what do we often do when we try to minister to somebody that doesn't end up helping them? to get to that goal. Like, are there things that we do that are, that we try to bring them to the church like in the wrong way? Or like try to show them truth in the wrong way? Like, I mean, can you guys think of anything? Anybody? Yes? Um, one of the things that I, I feel like <clears throat> Uh, goes wrong is where we make it absolutely the only way to to live okay, okay I don't want to sound like wrong but we, we make it look like people have absolutely nothing like they're trash without Christ you got nothing without Christ you only have a life with Jesus and while that is true you never want to be presented with something that devalues what you have completely you don't want somebody to come in and tell you that you're worth nothing without Christ. Even if it's true, people feel greatly offended by it. And that's not the way that Jesus came in. Jesus didn't come in. You need me. You're lost. You are not on the way to heaven. Jesus came in. What can I do for you before I, I call you to come to me? Yeah, you know, that, that's very true. You know, I appreciate you saying that because, yeah, you hit that on the head. Is there anybody else? that would have a comment? Okay. Oh, Dailene. So I feel like this especially applies to me since I tend to be like non-confrontational at all. So I, I would take what he said, but to the other extreme and just kind of like let them sort of indulge in everything and even in some ways be a, a bad testimony because you want to blend in. 
and you want to bring them to Christ, but you want to, you know, win them over and be their friends. And so sometimes we make the mistake that we allow ourselves to be so much like them that there's not even a difference. And so it gets to a point where people are like, why would I need to be a Christian? Why would I need to believe the same things you do if you're doing all of these things? And it, you might have good intentions by it, but sometimes we want to be such secret agents that we end up looking just like them. And so that would be another bad extreme to take it to. Yeah, you know, yeah, that's, that's very good too. And, you know, I know like, you know, now like a lot of churches, you know, are doing that in the Adventist church to try to bring the young people in. And it's really having a backwards effect in what, they're trying to do. Jose? Truth without the one, the giver of truth. Um, try and tell them with our own knowledge and try and explain it um, without asking God's blessing on it. And sometimes um, messages can be misunderstood or just um, taken the wrong way. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. One, one thing that I was, I, I really, the main thing that I thought about when I was like, okay, what is something that we have a tendency as people when we're trying to draw other people to Christ? What is one thing that, you know, maybe for me that I, I do wrong is we put ourselves to be the standard, like what we believe, like what we're, our personal convictions are, and then try to lead them to the same conclusions instead of leading them to the Bible, instead of leading them to the gospel where they can study out for themselves, we tend to just sho shove all our own convictions down them. And, you know, like, that, I've seen it, that, that's unhealthy because they need to come to the point where they can find what Christ is trying to tell them. Adon? Oh, okay, Adolfo. Oh, yeah. um, one of the things that... Uh, as as everyone else was mentioning, but one of the things that I've personally observed and experienced as well myself is that sometimes whenever you're trying to bring someone in or you're trying to convert someone, oftentimes they're treated like a number. Um, you know, a lot of times after an evangelistic series, we talk about, oh yeah, we baptized 25 people and, you know, we have 300 Bible studies going in, but what I've personally experienced myself is that a lot of people are uh, either not wanting to or unable to play the long game. And the long game is getting to know that person, um, understanding how they work, understanding their background, their life experience. And I think sometimes it's worth it a lot, uh, a lot of times to play that long game. And uh, it's not necessarily a game, but you get the gist of what I'm saying. Um, trying to get to know that person, trying to understand them, and in that sense, you are being more effective in trying to bring them in. Because a lot of times, you don't even have to bring them in. They'll start asking, hey, what are you doing? What makes you so different? Why, why are you taking the time to get to know me? You know, what makes me so special, right? right. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, those are some... Yes, Anjali. Another mistake I think we make sometimes is, um, I know a lot of people, they say, well, you know, I come to the Adventist church, but sometimes it's hard for me to see a difference, like along the lines of what Dailene said. They can't really see a difference between us and them, and they're longing for truth, but it seems like sometimes we go to the lower standard instead of lifting that standard, and... Um, even living it in our lives, I think sometimes, I know we all mess up and we all slip at some time, but just living Christ in our lives is, I think, a mistake sometimes we make when, you know, when we're around people, again, we lower our standards and they want to see a difference and they want us to lift up our standards. And so being a Christian, we are to live the life of Christ in our everyday life so that they see a difference in us. Yeah, you know, yeah, and that, that's very good. Okay, so, okay, one more comment on this, then we'll move on. Thank you guys for your comments, by the way. It's much appreciated.
I'll just just wait. Um, when I first started doing outreach, I started. I, I was seeing people of who they were in the moment instead of who they could be uh, uh, down through uh, the line, the path. Uh, when, for example, like I would see a guy going through, say, an alcoholic or a drug addict, I would see them as they as who they were at the moment and not who they could be. But hearing all the, you know, te uh, testimonies of how many people's lives have changed because somebody gave their time and actually cared for them, took time and gave them, you know, uh, counsels, gave them uh, the Bible, started giving them Bible studies. Um, I started seeing that, you know, G when Jesus came down here, he saw what was what they could be down the line instead of who they were in the moment. He never said no to Judas when, uh, when he joined the disciples. He saw what he could be, even though he didn't become. But Jesus loved him still, if, if I'll make my point clear. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, okay. So now we've kind of talked about some things that we kind of, you know, sometimes we do wrong. We are on the wrong side. Now, what is the right way to do ministry? And, hold on. Thank you. I'll remember. Just, all right. So, like, one thing that, like, that came to my mind is you can't just go up to somebody and say, hey, you need this, and then walk away. I mean, sometimes that works. But honestly, honestly, when you develop a true friendship with somebody and show that you're interested and show that you care about their life and that you want what's best for them, and then you start, you start sharing with them little tidbits and getting them used to the gospel, I think that is probably one of the most effective ways of reaching people, reaching your friends for Christ. Now, of course, you know, like Anji was saying, you know, living a consistent life, that goes huge. You know, you can, you can develop, you know, a great friendship with somebody and then try to preach to them and then go, you know, you know, to the movies or to the bar with them. You know, it, you have to, you, they have to see a difference in you. But yet, I think that when you're trying to reach people, you should really try to be their friend and really reach out to them, you know, and show that you care and let them know because that's what, really matters. Um, Dylene? So, um, yeah, what, something that came to mind was something that uh, Mr. Neal was always saying this quote, and I can't say it word for word, but it said that whenever, you know, Jesus was in his ministry, he mingled among men as one who desired their good. He healed their infirmities or something like that. And then he made them like follow me. And something that I really appreciated about like, you know, living here was the, the way that they, you know, really emphasize service. But, you know, it might be a bit cliche for us since we hear it so often, but it is truly, you know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care about them. And uh, the method of Christ is ultimately the best way of reaching souls for him, right? He was here to be our example. And the way that he did it was he didn't condone people and their behavior in sin. If you see how he takes care of each one of the cases, he never, he, he tried to help them. He showed that he cared. He didn't condemn them, but he didn't condone their sin either. And having a right balance between the two Sh lifting the standard higher, showing them how to by living a consistent life, and at the same time reaching them where they are, not condemning them to hopelessness just because they're not at your level or they seem to be in a really bad place. And that's the way that you know Christ did it, and it seems like a safe way to do it too. Yeah, yeah, I think we should. We're the safest when we follow Christ's method for reaching people. You know, and. Is, is, do I have, does the class end at 1030? Mrs. Clark? I think it ends at 1030. So I'm going to go ahead.
I'm out of time, and I need to let Daniela take over to give her portion. But yeah, so just remember, you know, when you're when you're reaching people, when you're befriending people, you know, remember that. Remember the goal of your life is to bring people to Christ's gospel, and that should be your focus in a friendship. And also, you know, there's right and there's wrong ways to do it. So just keep that in mind. And yeah, have fun, Daniela. Happy Sabbath. So can somebody turn with me to, or somebody read 1 Timothy um, 2, 3 to 4? No, 1 Timothy 2, 4 and 5. Mr. Laura, can read it? Verses 4 and 5. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth? For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Okay. So in making friends with, like, making friends for God, we need to be committed to Christ first, right? Because it's much easier that way, and we can be better witnesses that way. And um, here in the verse, I'm going to read it again. It says, Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one meditator between God and men. And the man Christ Jesus. So God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of God. And what does this tell us about God? What does this tell us about his heart? Right. Yeah. He wants us to be saved, right? You know? And, you know, sometimes, in, you know, we, trials come our ways and temptations and just problems. And then we just feel like, you know, the walk with God is so hard and we sometimes want to give up when we don't really know that in reality, we have somebody who wants to help us to be saved because he wants us there, right? And, you know, God is passionate about saving people. And First Timothy, no, um, Second Peter 3.9 says, He is not willing that any should perish, but should come to repentance. Um, can somebody read for me Acts 13.47? Acts 13.47. All right, Acts 13, 47. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light to the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And somebody can read Isaiah 49, 6. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. 
So who is it talking about in, in Isaiah? Who is it talking about? Who is to do this? Anybody? Yes, it's talking about Jesus. And then who is Paul talking about in Timothy? It's Timothy. Or no, in Acts. So in Isaiah talking about Jesus, and Paul used it to, you know, to, to be for like the you know disciples members of the church because, you know, just because Jesus, you know, died on the cross and, you know, even though, he, you know, he preached to the Gentiles and everything, doesn't mean that it's going to stop there, right? We have to keep, you know, talking to other people about Jesus and about the gospel. And, you know, sometimes it could be that we're just so, the church is just like not doing its job, not, you know, preaching, not, you know, taking the gospel to others, or, like, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, so what, what, what is the danger of that when the, the church is, like, so inwardly focused and doesn't go out and reach other people? Ezekiel? Or, okay. Um, yeah. One of the things that I was uh, thinking about while the other fellow was talking, and now that you continue, is uh, that the part of our mission as, as a church, the part of Jesus' mission, um, I remember one of my teachers in, in college told me, um, Jesus didn't only come to save us. When we make it about us, and I love the, the comment that the gentleman over there in the corner said, my brother, um, about playing the long game. Jesus came not only to save us. This is not about us as humans. This is all about God, all the praise, all the glory. So when Jesus came, he didn't come to save us. The whole plan of salvation is not focused around us. It's focused around vindicating the character of God to the universe. When we bring that to, this, uh, to the mission of the church, then the mission of the church is not convincing people that they should accept Jesus or that they need to be saved, but rather following the example of Jesus in John 3 that he said, when I am lifted up, I will attract other people to me. So we ain't here to convince people to be like, hey, you need Jesus, you need to come. No, just see Jesus and what Angeli was saying, just represent. When you represent, you don't need to convince nobody. I remember this... Uh, Example, this illustration that a, a preacher once said, he's like, we ain't called to be advocates of Jesus, lawyers. We ain't here to convince people, hey, Jesus is the answer. No, we're here to be witnesses. A lawyer has to debate. A witness just says, this is who I am. This is who I was. This is what happened. I met Jesus. Boom. That's, that's the difference. Jesus is a difference. And when we point people, instead of trying to drag people or, or take people, that changes. And that changes not only the way we reach them, but the way we live as well. Because we ain't living to, in one uh, part of our lives, convince people, and in another one, try to convince ourselves. We live an integral life in both sides, being just representatives of Jesus um, in the way we talk, in the way we walk, in the way we, we dress, we, we act, we everything. And that, that transforms how we do evangelism, how we witness, how people see our witness, because we are not preaching about Jesus. We are living Jesus, and we're lifting him up so that he draws people to himself. Um, you know, when talking about how to reach others, I really love this quote in Christ Object Lessons, and it's really been a uh, consolation of mine for many years, and it's just been such a big blessing. But it says, love is the basis of godliness. Wherever the profession, uh, no man has pure love to God unless he has unselfish love for his neighbor. Um, actually, let me go a little bit more down. The completeness of Christian character is attained when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within. When the sunshine of heaven fills the heart and is revealed in his countenance. So it's just a, you know, just a beautiful uh, picture of how we can get, you know, to the point um, 
where where God naturally just works in us, and it's when when we have that character by beholding Jesus. So we're supposed to be witnesses for others, but something about witnessing is that it helps us grow spiritually. But sometimes, you know, we honestly, like I said, first we have to actually have a connection with God, and we have to be faithful and obedient to his commandments. But I don't know if you guys ever heard, you know, fake until you make it. But sometimes people fake it and never make it. And that's, that's dangerous because we get caught up about like how being on the outside, witnessing to people on the outside, when in our home, in our hearts, it's completely opposite. So that is something we need to be very careful about, that just not only like depend on, depend on, you know, witnessing, like, or just like showing on the outside who you are. You have to, you know, truly consecrate yourself to God. Jose? Well, for fake it till you make it, um, we hear that a lot, but, and a lot of times people confuse it with when Ellen White speaks, she says, though you may, well, I don't know in exact words, a paraphrase, though you may not feel like you have the faith or you may not feel that God is with you, that we should act on our faith, and even though we may not have the feeling of it, that we should act on it as if we did have it. And it's not faking it because we're going on, we're trusting by faith that in his word that it will be accomplished. Mm -hmm. So there is a difference between faking it and going by faith and really trusting in God that it will happen. So I have one minute left. Um, I didn't finish what I had to say, but okay. This is something that um, really just caught my eye. It says, the one who created all creation, the galaxies, the stars, the angelic host, the entire cosmos, other worlds, was the one who died on the cross for us. How can this astonishing truth not create in us a love for God and the desire to share that love? Does, does anybody know? Or anybody have any ideas why? Some like you know, cause we say that a lot, and we, sometimes I, you know, we take it lightly. We say, oh yeah, Jesus died on the cross, or you know, um, John three sixteen. We don't really see the like the meaning and the value in that verse and how powerful it is. Does anybody like understand why it doesn't really have an effect on people sometimes or lately? I think that oftentimes we get so used to it, and um, I guess you never know what you have until you no longer have it. Um, we tend to live in the present. We tend to think about the here and now and the pleasures that we want to have, and a lot of very, very selfish thinking, honestly. and because of that, because we've become a culture that is so accustomed to catering to self-wants um, and desires, we forget the, the real value of life, of another human life, especially one that loved us so much to give everything for us. And I suppose uh, oftentimes it's, it's because of, of that selfishness that we don't see the value in in the sacrifice of, of Jesus for us. But I guess the only way that we can truly understand spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And you will never fully understand the sacrifice that Christ had for you until you have a relationship with him. And when you know him on a personal basis, then it becomes so much more meaningful to you. And I guess until then, you have to follow the advice of like what Jose was saying. Uh, of just having faith in it, even if you don't feel, uh, you know, the gratitude for him, or perhaps you don't feel the the, the relevance, not relevance, but the, you know, the value of of, of the sacrifice. Um, 
but yeah, by beholding him, we become changed and we become more, more, less selfish and more, um, I guess, <laughs> uh, sensitive to the, the sacrifice he made for us. So to close off, I'm just going to say that, um, you know, by sometimes or we're, we're witnessing to other people or we're talking to other people that, you know, Christ died for us on the cross. But, you know, there's a lot of people out there going door to door, you know, missionary and I don't know where, on the other side of the country. But their spiritual life is like they're dead within, even though they're like, you know, talking and preaching and doing good things. And they say that a lot to people or, you know, why, why are we giving our lives to Christ? It's because Christ gave us our, their, Christ gave his life for us. But um, something that, you know, I thought on what I just read before the question is that we don't believe it. Like, it doesn't really truly, we don't, like you said, Darlene said, we don't really understand it and we don't actually have that relationship with him, but we don't believe it either. So, yeah. <laughs> Does any, oh, okay, never mind. I'm gonna, I'm gonna close off with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just wanna ask that you may please um, bless us today and that you may walk with us, Lord, and that we may um, fully understand, Lord, that why you came to this world for us and um, why you came to die on the cross for each, and each one of us, Lord. Lord, I know that you don't want us to perish and you want us to be saved, Lord. So I just pray and ask that you may be with each one of us with our struggles and that you may help us get there, Lord. And that on that last day, we may see each other and be with our families. And I ask this in Jesus' name. We are so pleased that you could join us for this special event here at Wachita Hills Academy and College. If you've enjoyed this presentation as much as I have, you can go ahead and like, share, and subscribe to this YouTube channel. Also, if you'd like to support making programs such as these, you can find donation information in the description below. Thank you so much again for joining us, and may God richly bless you.